Hi everybody, welcome back to Happy Little Diodes and today we have our first full build. I must be doing something right because somebody sent me this kit and asked me to build it for them and I'm very excited to get into it. It is a ZX Nucleon with 512 kilobytes of memory, really exciting. The Nucleon is an evolution of the ZX Pentagon which you might have heard of. The Pentagon was, or is, a Soviet clone of the British ZX Spectrum first made in 1989, it's evolved over the years to have quite a list of capabilities. The most obvious of which being the expanded memory capabilities, the Pentagon can take up to 4 megabytes of memory if you set it up correctly. As well as compatibility with sound boards such as Covox or SoundDrive. The Nucleon builds on this design by adding bus drivers for all of the Z80 CPU bus signals, increasing the reliability, a redesigned reset circuit, a memory solution incorporating just one chip for all 512 kilobytes of RAM, and the addition of a button on the back to switch to 128 kilobyte paging mode for the RAM to increase compatibility. It also hosts a tape input jack with an amplifier, video output in RGB or SVHS formats, and the whole thing fits inside a rubberkey 48k specy case because they've removed the beta disk floppy controller. I'm simultaneously dead keen to get started and terrified of the surface mounted devices. There aren't many to do but I've never worked with them before so I'm a little bit nervous. I'm going to have to do them first anyway so I can access the pads um, before going on with the rest of the 261 components. Let's have a look at the power circuit because that contains a few of these SMD devices. IC50 is the biggest one or the one I'm most worried about, that's our 5 volt regulator. IC51 um, also forms part of the power circuit, but that's not SMD, that's the 12 volt supply. L4 is quite a big inductor, so I'm highlighting that, I'm a bit nervous about that. And D12 and D13 as well, I'm a bit less worried about because they're smaller. So let's open up our first little goodie bag and extract our IC50 and IC51. That's IC51, 12 volt regulator. Here's IC50, which is our 5 volt regulator, service mounted device that has a big old ground tab which is going to be difficult to get to stick. The plan is to uh, heat up that big pad and flood it with solder, keep it heated while we shove the regulator on from the side and as you can see here I'm really not committing to the idea I'm using a, a, a thin tip, I should be using a fat tip, I'm using a very thin solder um, uh, reel because I'm very nervous about overdoing it and really just uh, got frustrated, took the camera away and did it off camera. I'm glad I did because the job was acceptable in the end. Now for these five pins I'm going to put some flux on the top and solder each one individually because I want to be slow and careful. I'm not going to try drag soldering on a live fire exercise like this. Um, I'm using the fatter tip as you can see and did a pretty neat job. I also check continuity just to be safe. And there it is, my first SMD soldering job. Alright, we need to put L4 on next, um, if you saw in that shot the diode underneath would be too close to it if we place that one first. So here it is, there is a marking on it which I guess tells me the um, orientation of the windings, I don't think it matters but I was careful to put it on as the schematic told me to. So once again going in with the flux pen I'm going to heat the pad, uh, flood it with solder, just one pad by the way initially and then hope, uh, hopefully I can slide the inductor on from the side while continuing to heat the pad and get a good connection. You can probably notice I'm back to the thin tip and it didn't help me again, I got annoyed, took the camera away, put a fatter tip on and carefully placed it off camera and got it in the right place with a good connection in the end, so once again use the fat tip. Now for the other side, this went a lot better, uh, apply some flux heat the um, joint, so the pad and the, and the component, and then apply the solder to part of the pad that you're not touching with the tip, and that way you know that you've heated the pad sufficiently, and we got a good bond. Okay, starting to get a feel for this SMD stuff a bit. Hopefully these two diodes will go on easier because they're small and it should be easy to keep sufficient heat in the pad to make a good connection while we place the component. Okay, here we go, let's see if we're improving. Put some flux on the pad, we're going to heat the pad and flood it with solder. Come back to that small tip again, I never learn. We'll keep 
the pad and the solder heated while we slide the component in place and it's gone on lovely, much better than the other ones. I guess the smaller ones are a lot easier to work with. And again for the other side I've put some flux on, I'm heating the pad from one side and applying the solder to the other end of the pad, so I know the whole thing's nice and hot. And that's it, it's on there. Same again for D12, we don't need to go through the whole thing, let's just finish that up. Alright we're getting there with these passive components, just a couple more inductors to go on. We have L1 which is on the 5 volt supply to the AY sound chip and L2 which is on the 5 volt supply to the chip which encodes our video signal. As you can see these components are getting smaller but as I've learned that makes them easier to fit so I'm not too worried, I mean to a point. Obviously they get so small that you might accidentally inhale them. We're really getting into the swing of it now, we put some flux on, flood one pad, heat it and slide the component in place and then apply solar to the other side and it's on. Right, well we mentioned the video encoder, that happens to be a surface mounted chip so let's make that our first surface mounted chip to fit to this board. With a chip I'm going to stick some flux over the pads, I'm going to flood one pad in the corner with solder, I don't need much, I think the fine tip is fine here and the thin solder is fine as well. I'm going to tack the chip in place just like that. As I mentioned before, if you have the skills and the tip, you can drag solder all of these pins in one go, but I'm going to be slow and careful because I don't know what I'm doing, and do them all individually. And it, it did come out pretty neat. I think I got one solder bridge once. Uh, it was pretty easy to rectify with a little bit of copper braid. I already mentioned the line drivers which drive the bus signals from the Z80. Let's look in a bit of detail because it's interesting. Here's the schematic and I'll highlight the Z80 CPU. Uh, this chip looking thing here is actually just a schematic of the edge connector, so we don't need to worry about that. What we are interested in is this blue line which represents a bus containing lots of signals to and from the Z80. And these four chips which are our address drivers, these are all surface mounted chips which is why I'm looking at them now. There are two chips which drive the address bus one for the data bus and one for the control signals from the Z80. And if you look carefully, the bus is actually two separate buses. The green bus comes from the Z80, goes through the drivers and is outputted onto the blue bus which goes off to the rest of the machine. I did scope the data bus and the address bus after I got this thing running and the waves were perfect square 5 volt waves, really nice. Here they are fitted, I didn't want to bore you with footage of soldering all those pins but they look really good and I did check continuity from them all, just to be safe. Alright, that's our SMD devices all done. All that remains now is through hole soldering, which if you've watched any previous videos, is pretty much bread and butter, I think we won't have a problem. I'm going to start with the capacitors, so I've pulled out all the bags containing capacitors, and there's really quite a lot, there's at least 100, um, so let's get cracking. I wanted to get these big ones out of the way around the power circuit, just because I like the look of them. Before turning my attention to the dozens of decoupling capacitors, here they are on the power circuit. Nothing more to say about these really, um, they've obviously not messed around by putting loads in. Uh, let's just get going, there's our first few in. And I've got to say, with those SMD devices out of the way, this part started to get really fun, it felt like some kind of uh, ultimate Lego kit. And here's a bunch more fitted with some electrolytics too. The board is very well marked up, there's no mistakes on it as far as I could see, so it's very easy to follow. And also, and this is life saving, the documentation that the board comes with is searchable, so you can just hit Ctrl F, put the component in that you're looking at, and you can see where it goes and any nodes associated with it. So, moving on to transistors, or quite a few transistors, including this nifty little metal cased one. And then on to diodes. The diodes and resistors are all arranged vertically which saves space and these eight diodes are all next to the keyboard connector and there they are all standing in a row. Speaking of resistors, let's get started on those. As you can see here there's a nice little handy note on this bag, there's lots of that going on with this kit, it's really well put together. I'm including these resistor packs in my uh, resistor pile 
Uh, let's have a look at fitting one of those. It was quite tricky to stop it from falling out, so I bent the legs opposite each other like this before soldering it in place. Alright, good work. There's all our resistors, transistors, diodes and capacitors, and our surface mounted chips all in place. Let's get the clocks in. There are two, two clocks to go in, two crystals, um, and they're in this nifty little flat packaging, which is really neat. You really start to notice the weight of the board increasing with all these components attached to it. Okay, that's enough with the passives. Let's get some chips in place. There were sockets supplied for some chips, the main chips I suppose, like the Z80 or the RAM chip, but not for all of the chips. That did make me a little bit nervous fitting them all, but I thought it was worth the risk. I can always desolder them if I have to. That is, if I'm able to debug any faults, because this is quite a different beast to the 48k speckies that I'm used to. And here's all of our chips fitted. All that remains now is to fit the keyboard connectors and the ports and buttons on the back. Here's our keyboard connectors and here's our, what are these, these are ports, so our video port, our audio ports and the uh, power socket. Uh, two push buttons here for switching the memory paging modes and this one is for the reset button. These two big buttons have two positions. One switches between 512k and 128k memory paging and one is for switching the audio mixing channels from AACB to ABC. Here's our reset switch in place. It has kind of a funny action, it's got some give in it but it seems to be working pretty soundly. And finally our video connector, the 8 pin mini DIN female socket. Sorry, not finally, we still have the power socket, which is nothing special, just a normal barrel socket. Oh, I forgot these two. These are 3.5mm sockets for the audio out and the tape input. I did revisit the power socket to get it flush to the board. Um, the connections are quite beefy, so um, it took a little bit of doing, but there we go, we got it right. And there's our fully assembled board with one error. You need to pause the video and spot it, it is visible in that shot. Um, and we'll find out what the error is later. First I'm just going to enjoy looking at this finished board for a while before I risk plugging it in. Okay well I was excited to plug it in but I have to make my own video cable. Luckily the schematics are provided in the documentation. This is new territory for me, but feels like fairly low risk compared to soldering those SMD devices, so let's give it a crack. Uh, my first plan of attack was to buy a SCART cable, cut one end off, and then solder the wires into a mini DIN um, jack, which I bought. Here it is. I did actually buy the wrong ones initially. Um, you need that middle pin to be slightly offset. Uh, but anyway, it comes apart quite easily in a few layers. Um, until you're just left with the socket itself with the pins exposed to do your soldering. It's quite a delicate little thing and I wish they hadn't made it out of plastic because it does tend to melt as I found out. You can see here where the wires are meant to go into. The end of the SCART cable um, came apart fairly easily. Um, I just chopped the head off and then got the meter out and started testing continuity to figure out which wires I was interested in, cut the other ones back and started soldering. As you can see it was fiddly as hell, every time I heated it something melted whether it was the, um, the rubber on the wire, the plastic on the wire or the socket itself. Uh, in the end I gave up and decided to flip the rolls and I bought a fully populated mini DIN wire 
I've chopped one end off and bought myself also a empty SCART connector just with pins sticking out the back and this was so much easier all I had to do was clamp the wires into the corresponding pins add a dab of solder to be safe and we were away It was also much easier to keep track of because the wires in this cable were coloured differently instead of all being white. So anyway here it is, um, I also added the audio left, right and ground so I have the stereo audio incorporated into that SCART connector now, threw some heat shrink on the end and wrapped it to be safe, I don't want too much wiggling going on within that SCART connector. Which can only mean it's time to plug it in and see what happens. I was more than a little nervous but you know, what can you do? Let's try. Um, I had to pop in the audio to this connector and the mini DIN. We're ready to go. Alright, no, hang on, that's not so bad. It looks like a specky, at least. We have a white ish border and some kind of failure mode involving vertical lines, which um, is fairly familiar territory at least. Actually it was very easy to find the fault, um, the ROM wasn't doing anything, the chip enable pin was stuck on low or high, whatever inactive was, and I traced the fault back to this resistor R3 which I'd poked through a via instead of the actual marked joint that it should have been through. It was very quick and easy to fix. So let's give it another go. Yeah, now it's working. Not too sure what these lines are on the right hand side, I think that is just a glitch with my um, video converter. Unfortunately I can't get the aspect ratio to be correct with this converter but it's working and I'm overjoyed. Now obviously before I send this off I want to have some fun with it so I got myself a DivMMC device which will allow me to load TRD files like TRDOS files. This is a typical format that the larger demos come in like the 512 kilobyte demos or the 128 kilobyte demos. In fact to be safe I got my hands on two of these devices and they are very nifty, very well made. Well done Ben. Anyway I can't wait so let's have a little showcase of all the demos I could run on this thing ending with a 512 kilobyte demo of a Simon's Cat cartoon. Enjoy, thanks for watching, please like and subscribe.